So I thank you. Uh, yes, let us start. Yeah. So uh, welcome everyone to the third uh, webinar by CO2 India, and uh, it's, it's a great honor to uh, host Professor Ganpati Yadav. Uh, and I request uh, Professor Jitendra Bera, head of the Chemistry Department, IIT Kanpur, to uh, kindly introduce uh, Professor Yadav. You're muted, uh, Jitin. Uh, thanks, Vivek. Uh, uh, I'm Jitendra Bera from IIT Kanpur. Uh, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Ganapati D. Jadav. At the outset, let me acknowledge that it is an unenviable job to introduce someone in a very short time uh, who has achieved uh, so much uh, with so vast accomplishment. Uh, I'll be citing only a few highlights and will not be able to do justice uh, to paint a comprehensive picture of his uh, career. Professor Jadav, born 1952, had early education at Rajaram College, Kolhapur, affiliated with Sivaji University. Then he completed his bachelor and master degrees in chemical engineering at Ars 12, UD City, Mumbai. As he was serving as an asso associate lecturer in UD City, he received his PhD with Professor M. M. Sarma. He is presently the Emeritus Professor of Eminence at Institute of Chemical Technology, ICT, Mumbai. He has been vice chancellor of the same institute for 10 years, spanning 2009 to 2019. The research interest of Professor Jadav is wide and multidisciplinary, focusing on green chemistry, catalysis science and engineering, multi-phase reaction, kinetics of heterogeneous reactions, development of nanomaterials, nanocatalysis, enzyme catalysis, and many more. In recent times, Professor Jadav is engaged in energy engineering and processes, CO2 valorization, hydrogen production, and storage. Professor Jadav has published close to 450 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals and granted more than 50 patents. He has supervised close to 100 PhD students and executed 70 sponsored projects. His age index, as I checked last, is 64 with more than 15,000 citizens. Because of his contribution to chemistry and chemical engineering, he is recognized by academies, universities, industries, and governments. He is a Jesse Bosch Fellow since 2010, Fellow of PWS, Academy of Sciences of the Developing World, Fellow of three, three National Science Academies, Fellow of Academy of Engineering. He has been editorial board members of numerous journals. He was awarded Padma Sri by President of India in 2016 for exceptional contribution to science and engineering. And very recently, he is elected to the US National Academy of Engineering, USA, for his contribution to research, innovation, and teaching in green chemistry, catalysis, nanotechnology, and chemical engineering. He will be formally inducted into the NAE in Washington later this year. With ever challenging, with ever changing challenges and goals, Professor Jadav continues to contribute to the field at the highest level. Sir, you are an inspiration to our generation. We are highly grateful that you have agreed to give this CO2 network webinar. Sir, I request you to deliver your talk. We look forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bera. And thank you for this CO2 India network. Uh, because I think CO2 is a fixed stock and not a liability. So that is what I would like to start with that. So remember, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, where it was decided in 2015 that we will have some sort of climate agreement. And what the nations of the world decided, that is some 195 odd nations, that we should restrict the temperature of the globe to less than 2 degrees Celsius and preferably 1.5 degrees by the middle of this 21st century. Believe me, United States of America was not part of us for whatever reasons. And uh, but President Joe Biden made it as a mandate for his election as a president. And he said that he will go for net zero emissions by 2050. So last year in April, he organized the so called climate summit, where our honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji also had participated in what they decided that we must look at the climate crisis afresh 
and we should reduce the emissions and let it be a net zero goal by 2050. And that is what was said. So if you look at historically what has happened, billions of metric tons of carbon dioxide have been released between 1750 and 2018. So this slide shows that United States has been number one in emission of carbon dioxide, followed by China, Russia, Germany, UK, Japan, and India stands at number seven. So that is a fact of the matter. So nations of the world, uh, which are shown on this slide, must consider very seriously to reduce carbon dioxide emissions and go up the net zero. So what happened? in Glasgow in the so-called CO26. On day one, our Prime Minister committed that we will go for net zero by 2070. So I'm asking this question, why not 2050? What will be our problem if we say that our goal should be 2050? So let us look at it. My personal belief as a scientist, an optimistic scientist, is that we will achieve this before 2050. In fact, rest of the world will also achieve it maybe for us by 2045, that's my guess. So what happened in that the IPCC Indian government and, you know, panel, uh, they said, the, let us look at this carbon dioxide emissions. In 2020, for instance, uh, in January, the emissions were, you know, 410 ppm, okay? And January 2021, they were 412. Remember, there was a slowdown in the economy across the world. However, the emissions increased. That means we were still using carbon source as, you know, uh, as a source of energy. And this year, to up to yesterday, it is about 419 ppm. That means we are emitting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if there is no technological intervention, by 2250, this temperature rise could be beyond, so this is your estimate, this will be beyond six to eight degrees. So that will be disastrous for the whole world. And what is the reason? The reason is because our economy is based on carbon. And so there is a little bit of historical perspective, and I will tell you that also. All of you know that fossil and non-fossil fuels, and what is happening here today is that people are saying, can we have the variable capacity refineries where we go from crude to chemicals? So majority of the refineries have fuel as a basis. However, we are talking about something else. So there is one refinery in China where 45% of the, you know, uh, uh, the production is for petrochemicals. So if you take coal or you take natural oil and oil and natural gas, ultimately the end result is what? And as again that we are talking about biomass refinery, so-called biorefinery, where we have all sorts of conversion processes, whether it is chemical, biochemical, or thermochemical. Uh, ultimately, what happens? The fate of this carbon is carbon dioxide. So in carbon neutral cases, see CO2 which is coming from biomass, and if it is tackled, then we can say it is net zero. So what happens? So we wrote a very important paper, which was published in September 2020. It is a sort of policy paper. We have taken care of the policies across the world. So what I'm trying to tell you is that carbon is a very important source for making materials and chemicals and polymers for that matter, right? So can you show any three man-made materials which do not use chemicals, for instance? So if you are not chemist or chemical engineer who doesn't understand, he will say, okay, I can show something. And if that is the case, look around, whatever you are right now using, whether it is a computer or mobile phone or the gadget which you are using in your office, does it, is it prepared without using chemicals? And if you can prove that, including the mask which you are using right now, if you go outside, then you will get a price of 100 million pounds, okay? Nobody has come forward and said that, okay, I can make something man-made without chemicals. So answer is chemicals is going to be a part and parcel of our life, whether we talk about net zero or otherwise. 
very important message. So, but we have to educate the people. So yes, so what it means that the climate change, energy and environment, they are very intimately connected, okay? So what do we do? At the same time, I want to give you a, you a proposition, and that is biomass should not be used as a source of energy. And for that matter, whether biomass is a new source of energy as we are claiming today, historically, it is something else. So I'm going to argue that as well. My, according to me, okay, sorry, according to me, unfortunately, the background is changed. There is a trinity. Now, what is the trinity? The trinity is solar, wind, and hydrogen. Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh, that's what we call in Hindu religion. Are the Christians will talk about father, son, and you know, holy spirit. Okay. So my scientific trinity is solar energy, wind energy, and hydrogen. Okay. And hydrogen is going to be the savior of the world. That is my thesis. And I'm going to prove that why hydrogen can be a savior. Very interestingly, on 17th of February 2022, the Ministry of Power notified the green hydrogen policy and green ammonia policy. Very interesting policy. This should have been done long time ago, but yes, at least it has been announced. And 50% of the country's energy requirement will be done by using renewable energy by 2030. So ammonia is a source of hydrogen, as you know that. And hydrogen, green hydrogen, or blue hydrogen for that matter. So what it means, whenever you have carbon-based fuels, we have to take hydrogen as a seed. And hydrogen is the cleanest of the all fuels, okay? And we know that any high carbon containing source can be reformed by using steel, for instance. So let us look at some of these things. But before that, I must tell you a little bit of history why this so much of carbon dioxide is being emitted, and particularly when we base our economy on crude oil. In the crude oil business, there is a primary, secondary, and tertiary return. So what it means, when you, you know, release the pressure of the reservoir during the primary recovery, almost you get anywhere between 10 to 15 percent of the oil, which is pushed because of the pressure drop, which is generated inside the room. During the secondary recovery, you have to use some displacing fluid, and that is typically, for instance, water. And that water is not pure water, it is mixed with some chemicals in water. And so at the end of that, you are still left with anywhere between, you know, 60 to 70 percent of oil inside. And that has to be recovered. And so, so called enhanced oil recovery or tertiary recovery is meant to take it out. But however, everything does not come out. Okay. So, this is what is the barrel of oil, crude oil, the oil in place 10 to 15 percent, 10 to 20 percent, and tertiary recovery where we have a lot of scope. So, you look at this particular slide. So, when you drill the well, some wells go dry. Some will generate gas, some will generate oil and water. So gas, oil and water, these are three fluids which are there in the reservoir. And that is what we have been playing with, right? So the, the oil recovery business, primary, secondary and tertiary, still there will be a lot of oil left in place because the technology by 2054, we will have exhausted all this oil. So what is the source for our carbon, okay? The renewable carbon. And how that can be used for, you know, getting these chemicals and metal. That is what it is. So yes, we look at this. So primary, secondary, and tertiary recovery, all these interesting aspects have been debated. In fact, during 1960s, because I used to work in this area of oil recovery, and so, you know, in 1960s, the Society of Petroleum Engineers Journal, SPAG, United States, very big society, he said, one of the professors argued that because that time the crude oil was very cheap, maybe about a dollar. So per barrel. So he said, why not import all these crude oil from Middle East and place it in their reservoirs, empty reservoirs, depleted reservoirs and naturalize it. 
So it becomes theirs and they can use it after 50, 60, 70 years. Now, <laughs> that was a prophecy at that time. People laughed at that idea. And so then, then we had this oil embargo in 1970. All sorts of things happened in the crude oil. Now, because of this Ukraine crisis, it has crossed gone to 100 plus, 110, okay? Something like that. So obviously, one of the ideas is carbon dioxide sequestration. They say, why not use these dry wells where you can store this carbon dioxide and that becomes a feedstock for you whenever you have technology and you want to convert that carbon dioxide into chemicals and molecules. So let us debate that also. Okay. Ultimately, whether your carbon dioxide is coming from petroleum-based industry or the bio-based industry, end result is carbon dioxide valorization. And that is what is required for the net zero goal. Okay, that is what is required. So at the same time, this is a regular picture uh, in North America. And these days you cannot go to Delhi because it's so much of fog. The plates are always dealing. It's a particulate matter because the farmers are burning wealth. Actually, this is a wealth. This is something like 350 million metric tons of this agri waste is wasted. Can we not convert that into something else? So this is what it is. So biomass should be a source of chemicals and materials. Okay, so what I'm saying that biomass should not be wasted on biofuels, which is the policy of the entire world. And I'm arguing against that. And I will tell you why I'm arguing that because you have done some calculations. So obviously there are a variety of chemicals, you know, whether it is intermediates, building blocks, go to primary, secondary, tertiary, ultimately in seed materials, right? So whenever you have any biomass, you have to separate it, you have to dry it, and you create all sorts of chemicals, fodder, and what. So yes, so once you have biomass, whether it is lignous or is the biomass, wood biomass, whatever, gasification will lead to seed gas, and once you have seed gas, you go to fissure crop synthesis, materials, and what variety of things. Or you have liquid action and the bio oil has to be also, you know, upgraded. Maybe hydrogen is used. And the liquid phase reforming will give us silos, glucose, liquid, and all these things is well known to people who are working in this area. So ultimately, we have oil refinery versus bio refinery. Very interesting. But oil refinery also needs hydrogen. Oil refinery does not work without hydrogen. So where are they getting that hydrogen? So we'll discuss it. So the basic question is for planners and energy experts, okay, should biomass be used for making biofuels? Okay. So this is our typical refinery. So from petrol to heavy oil, the boiling point increases to the bottom, right? So we have resilient. So that is a so, and in today's refinery, you see that. The simplified diagram shows many important processes and they are all catalytic processes. Whether it is reformer, alkylation, cracking, you know, what, what not. Everything is catalytic and we have all sorts of catalysts. We know that and we require reactors of this kind. So unless we have the reactor technology, multiphase reactors and the catalysts, we cannot process it. So importance of multiphase reactor design becomes very important. So ultimately what it means, the contribution of chemical and allied industry, which starts with petroleum, then natural gas, air and sulfur, and we go on processing. We, we have the commodity chemicals, secondary commodity, intermediates, and various products. And what the Janta sees is textiles, food supply, transportation, housing. They don't care about how it comes because the chemical industry is a consumer in itself, 60 to 70 percent of chemicals don't go to the shelf in the market, okay? They are used by another, you know, industry. That is the beauty of it. So what I'm coming back to this, that whatever refinery process on the left-hand side, the current refinery, crude oil refinery, and the so-called bio-refinery on the right-hand side, there is a commonality. And what is that commonality? The commonality is the hydrogen. So if you look at the refinery processes, there are seven of these refining processes. All of these things are based on hydrogen. So, and where are they getting this hydrogen from? They are getting from steam reforming of natural gas. That is the so-called gray hydrogen. And the other part of that carbon goes as carbon dioxide. So, that is what 
we are doing, and that is where the temperature of the globe is increasing, right? And apart from you know the coal power plants and transportation and what. On the contrary, even in the biorefinery, hydrogen and oxygen are required to valorize those you know materials, right? Those heat stuff. So, so hydrogen is going to be the savior in both cases. So let us look at the you know world's primary energy consumption, and I mentioned a particular number that by 2054, according to the BP Energy statistics, we will not have any crude oil because the technology which is available then will not be able to extract that crude. It will be very expensive, and believe me, not all crude oil will be taken out modern. It will be still there. And there will be alternate sources of energy, renewable sources of energy. Therefore, some crude oil will be remaining there. In fact, there is another prediction by 2018. You know, a lot of crude oil will be there, but nobody will extract it from other world because of this, you know, net cost, net zero goal. So if you look at the, you know, this uh, carbon dioxide emissions, typically they are about 35 gigatons. Okay, 35 gigatons. And we are talking about 2 degrees and 1.5 degrees C. That means we have to have dramatic reduction in the carbon dioxide emissions and we have to come to something like 10 gigatons. That means 25 gigatons of carbon dioxide has to be less. That means we go maybe solar energy, wind energy, geothermal and whatnot, or nuclear or hydro we have to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, that is one. Or even if there is a carbon dioxide, it has to be converted into something valuable. So the, the, con the contribution of the renewable is going up. Perhaps you should know as a commoner, some of you might know that, that the rate at which the electricity generated in a given country indicates the economic growth, that is the GDP. Because everywhere electricity is required, and if we require electricity, we should generate that electricity by renewable sources. Okay, and this renewable will contain solar, wind, biomass, biomass, because we are going to have some additional, uh, you know, gas reserves which will be discovered. So, if you look at the changing structure of the global energy, even by 2050, there will be still coal being used. Although the contribution of the, the so-called uh, biomass or renewables is going to go, in, in, to go on increasing, right? The geothermal or wind and whatever. The, the co contribution of petrol will continue to go down, okay? But coal will be still used because some of the power plants are power, coal based coal plants, okay? So I mentioned earlier that in 2020, we were consuming something like 97.4 million barrels per day. So refinery required that as a fish. Okay. That number is crossed 100 now. Okay, that number is crossed 100 now. So if you want to bring down the temperature of the globe, our refineries have to consume less of this food. Or even if they consume it, that carbon dioxide which is going out has to be, you know, extracted from here. And how do we do that? Okay. So at the same time, natural gas, you know, funding will go up. So we will have some natural gas. Natural gas is taken to be near zero, you know, of carbon energy. So you have to cut carbon capture and utilize and store. So obviously, in the net zero goal, you will see that. If we want to have, you know, by 2050, the lot of these things so will be based on blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. So that is what is going to happen. The cost of the wind and solar energy will go down. And what will be the contribution? That will be something like 73% of the renewable energy. That is what I'm going to show you here. So look at this blue and green. By 2050, you see only green, green hydrogen and blue hydrogen will be there. Okay, so and there will be carbon capture if at all anything is produced, okay, including natural gas and coal, because coal will still be green, right? And this statistics is based on you know information provided by the International Hydrogen Council, European Union, and the Bloomberg and New Energy Funding. Okay, so what it means. For anything, 
to be for the hydrogen economy to be realistic, we have to have hydrogen production by a very benign method. So what is that? So you have natural gas, what the refineries are doing, are your natural gas reforming, you have carbon dioxide and hydrogen, and the gas pyrolysis, because see these days, they, in fact, the three uh, hydrogens are subdivided. Somewhere it is called ground, somewhere it is called partially, what okay, that is gas pyrolysis, where you generate carbon and also hydrogen. And many times people are claiming they have made carbon nanotechnology. Yes, all right. So we have green hydrogen, where electrolysis of water, this can come from many sources, okay, including the thermochemical methods. And you have blue hydrogen, where you have steam reforming, where you have carbon capture up to 90%. And then the steam reforming of fossil fuels, that is gray hydrogen. So in the blue hydrogen, okay, many times the natural gas, which is mostly methane, that can be converted to hydrogen and carbon dioxide is capture. That is what the blue hydrogen is. And in the methane pyrolysis, you know, if you take 4.4 tons of methane, you get 1.1 ton of hydrogen and the carbon is uh, something like 3.3. So that one ton of hydrogen is something like $944. This is the calculation done by the, some of these people in the international union. So now the instead of just three, they are talking about five shades of hydrogen. They say green, they blue, turquoise, gray, and brown. Okay, brown is cool. Okay. Gray is steam reformation, but no carbon capture. Okay, that is what they are saying. But if you look at the cost of these hydrogens, in the so-called brown, which is based on coal, coal gasification, no carbon capture, that cost is look, look at the highest dark greenhouse gas emission, 19 tons of carbon dioxide per ton of hydrogen. And that is a big problem. So here that cost is much lower, $1, $1.2 $1 to $2.1 per kg. Gray hydrogen, natural gas, they're steam reforming. High, which is something like 11 tons of carbon dioxide per, uh, per ton of hydrogen, the cost is almost similar, $1, $2.2. Blue hydrogen, natural gas, and you have the advanced gas reforming in carbon capture and storage. So it is about 0.2 tons per carbon dioxide. This could be anywhere between 1.5 to 2.2. That is what is predicted, okay? And renewable hydrogen, this will be, okay, water splitting, you will have something like 3 to $7.5 per kg. What is targeted? It is targeted to have less than $2.5 per kg. Okay, so obviously, what happens for our materials and chemicals? Obviously, if we go to biomass, take lignin or, you know, cellulose, hemicellulose and all those things, these are catalytic reactions. So oxidation, see how many oxidation reactions are there. So if I do water splitting and get hydrogen is one part of the story and the oxygen can give me many, many different compounds. And I'm going to argue a little later that biofuels, you know, is not a good idea. In the, the carbon should be converted into value added chemicals. Okay. So on one hand, we want more energy at the same time, we want less carbon. That is the dual target. So if you look at this scenario, energy scenario in 2050, that is the so-called net zero mark, 73% of this will be renewable and that will stand at something like 49,000 terawatt. And majority of that will be hydrogen and wind, okay? And then other things will be there. That is all right. So that is nuclear, you may have gas, you may have coal, okay? You may have hydro, all the things will be there. But this is what is going to happen, which, you know, as far as the world scenario is concerned. However, I want to take you back into history. What were they doing? Because our economy is based on carbon. What were they doing before? Well, there is a concept called whale oil revolution. During 18th and 19th century, in the North American region, they used to capture whale. And the blubber of the whale was used for getting oil, okay, that is the illumination part of it, and the other was used for making soap. What happened? Because as the population was increasing, the population of whale was dwindling and going down and down, almost to the level of extinction. So that is what happened, and these are the so-called islands. 
we have given this history in our paper, okay, which is very popular. There we have also given this part of the history. Thanks are due to Edwin Gray, who drilled the first well in Turkus well in 1859. And that served the well population, remember. So biomass as a source of energy was already practiced, but not well was not the right idea. Okay, we have to use biomass, right? Not the well. So in 1859, when he drilled that well, around 1860, what it was found that, and then later on they were trying to distill it, and that is how the you know cracking of oil, thermal cracking of oil happened. So they got petrol, kerosene, and heavy oil. Now, kerosene was used for illumination. However, petrol had no use, so they used to dump that petrol in sea, lakes, and streams, and whatnot. Thanks are due to Henry Ford. In 1907, he introduced the first automobile which used petrol or the gasoline, and that is how petrol was found to be very useful in fuel. During World War I, you see the the refinery processes evolved like energy and all sorts of you know technologies they have been developed to increase the yield of gasoline you know, because the automobile industry was increasing well and also a very interesting way that is the time when um, synthetic ammonia was also you know, made available Haber Bosch must be thanked for that in fact they got a Nobel Prize right? you know that so Synthetic ammonia was there, which was required for making nitric acid and the nitro syringe and what explosion which was used in World War I. However, during meanwhile, from World War I to World War II, during 19, you know, 20s, 30s, they started using, because the, again the cracking was a business, so they started using clay. Okay? Howdy was the person who used it, clay. Now clay, acidic clay, and you have the properties, and also it became a catalyst, right? So the refine and the yield of the the the, the, the crew, the, the diesel and petrol, kerosene and the aviation fuel, all that increased, and the Allied forces, including Russia, they won the Second World War because of a better quality, and it is recorded, it is historical evidence, and I mentioned that in our paper. So you can see that. This industry was growing at a very fast rate. We had better quality medicines, paints, and polymers, and whatnot. So the quality of life increased. So we have to thank this carbon-based economy for that similar reason. Okay, so life expectancy also increased. However, there was a problem. And what was that problem? Now there was a surge in production of petrol and food, it is during the 1940s. And in early 60s, Mobile introduced zeolite catalysts. The so-called ultra-stable zeolite became much later than all refineries across the world started using ultra-stable zeolite. So catalysis played a very important role. Now, during World War II, you know, the Russian army had a general called Vladimir Ifatiev. Vladimir Ifatiev was a great scientist. He was a catalyst guy. He used to, you know, develop catalysts. So this platforming and all these reforming catalysts, it is his contribution. He had more than 200 pages. However, when the war ended, he retired from the military of Russia and he, he traveled by train to Germany with his wife. And he told his wife to look at Germany. This is given by UOP history. That is called Ideas for Red. If you read UOP history, you will find this interesting anecdote there. So he told his wife, look at Russia for the last time, we are not coming back. He goes to Germany, the Americans were waiting for him to be immigrated to the United States. But he was a colorful man. He had a concubine. So they took the concubines also, because they were interested in his science and not on his colorful life. He did not know anything but German and Russian. But Vladimir, in fact, he contributed greatly to catalytic science. All these refinery processes, he is a contributor. He was nominated for Nobel Prize, but he was never given because he was a military general. Like our Mahatma Gandhi never got Nobel Prize, but by not giving Nobel Prize, he is remembered. But Vladimir Ifati was one of a great character who did not get Nobel Prize because he was associated with military. So this is a very little bit interesting history of technology. So what we did, in our paper, we said, can we find out what is meant by crack spread? And crack spread for a layman's language 
What is Kirk said? That is, suppose your barrel is available today at hundred and ten dollar. Can I make hundred and thirty dollar? That means twenty dollar is a crack spread. Cracking of the group giving me what value to the additional product. So what we did? We have no data for India. We have data for North America. We collected data from U.S. Department of Energy and said, supposing we have a bio refinery, what is the pipeline? What sort of you know infrastructure is required? So we analyzed that. So what we found that one kg of crude oil gives 32 megajoules of fuel plus 0.2 kg of chemicals. That is the current refinery scenario. However, if you take one kg of biomass. Either you get six megajoule energy or 0.8 kg of chemicals. So what is good, right? This is the energy and material balance. So we found that since I talked about 97.4 million balance per day, that turns out to be something like 250 bar, 15 balance per second, not in the processing capacity. So if I convert 100 percent of this biomass into energy, only I get 10 barrels per second. But if I convert 100% of biomass into chemicals, I get 320 barrels per second. So common sense tells me that it is better to convert biomass into chemicals and not fuels. Even if you make bioethanol, convert to ethylene and all sorts of things. Okay, that is what should be done. That makes economic sense. I'm a chemical engineer, so I can talk about economics, right? So yes, so what we did, we also looked at the investment by US Department of Energy on various projects and there were many more failures on the biofuels, bioethanol particularly, than successes, okay. So we also looked at methanol because methanol is a pet subject. Government of India, Niki Oil, Dr. Miki Sarso talks very passionately about methanol. So how are you going to get methanol? Once you generate thin gas, you can make methanol. Or once your carbon dioxide converted into methanol or dialogue. So carbon dioxide is a feedstock for making methanol. Okay? And we can make all sorts of chemicals, okay, including gasoline blending, MTB, volatiles, acetic name it. So methanol economy, I got a very big article on this in Greek chemistry. So methanol economy is reality. So that is one part of the story. Okay, however. If you have a biomass and you have C5 and C6 sugars or cellulose, any cellulose, I can use hydrogenation and oxidation to create large sorts of chemicals, right? And that is what is given here, okay? All these are catalytic processes. And if I take biomass and I do oxidation, these are all, and hydrogen or this is CC, I'll make all sorts of chemicals. So in the refinery, I have benzene toluene inside. Here, I may have something else, maybe HMA. Maybe you will make us say, maybe something else. All sorts of things can be made. So rich catalog of catalytic processes exist for biomass conversion into chemicals and materials and not for biofuels, right? So it is all known. So you may have xylitol, perpyrrol, sarbitol, name it. A lot of these things we have done in our life. Now I'm switching gears and going to something else because government of India has bland single use plastic and I have a different thing. There are seven different types of plastic, whether it is polyethylene, polypropylene, high density, PVC, low density, you know, polystyrene and acrylics and nylons and TP and what, right? So, and the policy says that single use plastic should be banned. Okay, so I have a slum little bit, you know, the information here. So, single use plastic ban in many of the states in the United States. There is a like California has a plastic bag. Then there are plastic bag taxes in GC. And there are recycling and reusing programs. In Europe also it is like. And India decided to ban single single products in the last year, October, right? My personal belief is that ban is a bad idea. Ban is not a solution. If one technology creates a societal problem due to the irresponsible overuse by citizens, another technology should solve it. And that is what the history of technology is. Legislation is second. So my thesis was like this. For example, plastic pollution, which is done till today, is one problem. Plastic pollution likely to be done to tomorrow onwards is another. So what is the solution? 
the solution is because 80% of the cost is on collection and I'm sorting out the numbers. So why not improve the collection mechanism? The collection mechanism is what supposing you are polluting back, right? Which the you know the vegetable vendor uses since it is free. So if you are charging some deposit, say argument say one plastic board, however thin it is, suppose you say two rupees, you will return that plastic, right? And that will be you will try to get your money back. In fact, you may save your neighbor's plastic bags. Then you, you may find it funny, but fact of the matter is that like a newspaper vendor, the newspaper boy comes to your doorstep, at least in big city, to distribute that newspaper. You don't throw that newspaper, you collect it as a rubbish, right? And the best newspaper you sell it and get the money. The newspaper is always recycled, right? In the cardboard and it is never thrown or it is not good. Supposing I have another boy coming to my doorstep to collect the polythene bag. And he says, give me your polythene bag and this is your deposit. I am having the digital economy. So maybe I have given one rupee. He says, give me back 95 cents. Five cents, he takes paisa bag for his you know, services. Well, we will not have any pollution. That is the solution because whenever you ban something because of overuse, people find some smart tricks of driving the officers. That happens even now. So banning is not the solution. So what is the solution for waste plastic chemical recycling? So there is upcycling, downcycling and whatnot. So your depolymerization, energy recovery, and all sorts of, all sorts of plastics can be recycled. So we have chemolysis, pyrolysis, gasification, right? So chemolysis is the use of chemical to break. So we have hydrogenation, okay? So we can have hydrogenation reaction is one important part. And you know those who are doing this. There's so-called dual function tightness, you have acidity and you have metal on that. So in the plastic way, PVC will give me HCl, PET will give me water, polyamides will give me ammonia, and rubber will give me HCs. And these technologies are known to the refinery industry, absorption of ammonia, okay, or absorption of HQs. Class process, super class process, recovery of sulfur. In fact, refinery would like to have a crude which has got some sulfur, maybe about two, three percent, because that sulfur becomes a source of making sulfuric acid and it is required. So that is all technology is well known to us. So it is better to have these catalytic processes for developing this thing. Oh my God, there is something wrong. But anyway, so what it means, hydrogen is required for depolymerization. Converting that, that polymer into something else, which is useful, maybe monomer, okay, maybe you go back or convert into something else. Hydrogen will play a very important Another important problem is steel production. Steel production, China is number one, India is number two. This year we will have 120 million tons of steel. And steel industry is highly polluted. One ton of steel produces something like 2.5 ton of carbon dioxide. So imagine how much carbon dioxide is there. What we can do, we can use hydrogen. Okay, so yes, that is what is required. So you can use hydrogen. Maybe you are water splitting or whatever. You get that hydrogen and you can, you know, eliminate all that problem of carbon dioxide. Right. So remember, this is what it is. About 2.25, you know, of carbon dioxide per ton of steel is you know, coming. And there are many other processes there where the carbon dioxide is coming. You see how many places the carbon dioxide and in the net zero carbon electricity, it will be hardly needed, right? So that is what is required. So as you are going on using the hydrogen technologies, whether it is hydrogen refueling stations, which is being talked about in India, are the fuel cars, because there are two types of you know, cars. One is fuel cell based uh, car, which will be two wheeler, three wheeler, four wheeler, and long distance tracks and all those things where you require long mileage, obviously we go hydrogen as a fuel, right? That is what is going to happen. And the cost of this hydrogen storage and fuel sales is going to come down day by day. That is what is going to happen. But what about the production of hydrogen? Currently, steam reforming of natural gas is the maximum use. It is 38%. Then other than natural gas reflection, what are you absolutely? And sometimes you have, you know, coming from the plural First is sodium hydroxide production already produces hydrogen, right, which is huge, consumed by the US. 
So in the so-called blue hydrogen, where you have biomass also, like for example, you may have ethanol, you may have methanol also coming from biomass, you may have ethylene glycol, you may have glycerol, you know, or uh, n butanol All these things, n butanol do the maximum value. We work all these processes. We have patents and publications. However, what we developed as the ICT Mumbai, OVNDC Energy Center, hydrogen production technology. They have been supporting my life research since 2006. It has been going on even now. Okay. So here, what we have developed is that we can produce hydrogen in less than a dollar. Okay. Remember, one kg of you know, hydrogen co-produces 8 kg of oxygen. And if you look at the international pricing structure of oxygen, it is about 10 cents per kg. So one kg of hydrogen, whatever is the cost, if I say it is 90%, I get already value added of 80 cents per kg. Even if I miss my calculations, some hidden costs are there, I will never go above the so-called standard cost of $2 per kg. So what I am saying, I can produce hydrogen less than a dollar. So we have done experiments and we have coupled that with solar energy because in our cycle, which is copper cooling cycle based on that, we require solar energy. So yes, so why hydrogen? Because hydrogen has the highest specific energy. It is better than anything else. In fact, many times people are asking me those questions, hey, doctor, what about the safety of hydrogen? I said hydrogen is safer than petrol. It is 14 times lighter than air. So it goes in atmosphere, right? Only thing there is upper and lower level. So hydrogen is not as dangerous as petrol, which is heavy. So it is very interesting, but people don't believe. They think it is hydrogen bomb. It is not deuterium or lithium. Hydrogen bomb is that, not the hydrogen which you are using H2. Okay. So yes, there are many methods of you know hydrogen production. We talked about you know paper. So yes, water splitting is one of the best. So water splitting by you know, uh, you know, by method by which you get hydrogen. So yes, you have thermochemical method, you have electrolytic method, you have photolytic method. Okay, and everybody knows about it. And we are talking about solar hydrogen. This is the source of energy. For example, you have iron sulfur cycle or copper chlorine cycle, which I'm going to talk about. So if you look at the reforming technologies, steam reforming is the most widely used in mature technology. And if I'm trying to develop technology, I must compare with what is available in the market and where I stand. Sometimes you may get beautiful results on the laboratory scale, but when you try to scale it up, you go flat because you don't know how this scale up is to be achieved. So yes, so this is the copper chlorine cycle. Then this is there are two more than 200 different cycles. So on the copper chlorine cycle, we got many international patents. We modified them. It is not that we developed it, but we modified them. We had different uh, ideas. So yes, so if we compare this technology mat maturity, steam reforming and partial oxidation are commercial. Look at the efficiency, 60 to 85 percent. Biomass classification, 35 to 50 is still commercial. Alkaline, uh, you know, electrolyzer, 50 to 60 is commercial. That means you must have a decent efficiency for your cycle, okay, and then only it will be useful. So we have mature technology, reforming electrolysis. Yes. The cost of the electrolysis is, is literally because of electricity. If you produce electricity at a very cheap rate and the electrolyzer costs go down, you are in the business. But right now it is not happening. And there are future technologies in that our technology. So what we, we did, we compared with whatever is available, published literature on natural gas and coal and whatnot. And the cost varied anywhere between $1.3 per kg to something like $10 per kg. Okay. And so there were 19 of these published things, and this is also given in 2019 report. I compare my process, which is solar for thermochemical, I can produce at 95 cents. So, yes, now we are going to Goa and setting up a big pilot plan with the help of OEGC and government in India. So, what it means when we do this life cycle analysis, Green hydrogen gives me zero greenhouse gas. Steam reforming of natural gas generates 9 kg. Okay. Steam reforming of natural gas carbon capture 90% and 50%, 56% in 1 and 4 kg. And here the natural gas prices were taken from European Union. Right now the natural gas prices have gone because of the war. 
So you can see that this is anywhere between 26.8 US dollar per megawatt hour, and electricity cost will be 40 to 106 US dollar per megawatt hour. And the capacity cost is 730 per kilowatt. Okay, this is what it is. So if you look at the electrolyzer cost, it is about 1100 US dollars. In India, they are talking about 1500 US dollars. So it will go down to 550 by 2030 and 220 by 2040. That is what is targeted. The carbon capture increases the cost of steam reforming of natural gas. And already I told you that natural gas is near carbon sources, right? But that will cost will go anywhere between 920, 990 to 1850 kilowatt. So you can see, imagine. There is a cost associated with carbon capture. And low carbon fossil based hydrogen is about, you know, in next uh, by 2030, which is $2.5 to $3. And that is what in European Union is targeting. And green hydrogen should be in this age. What it means if the solar electric cost is competitive because electricity is required in, even in those cycles, we require cost of electricity to go down. Okay, so the installed PV power can be reduced. If for example, which is about dollar uh, five per watt to dollar one, then the solar electricity cost will be about ten cents per unit kilowatt hour. That is what is predicted. So ultimately, what it means that your target for any technology should be including the operator, operational and maintenance cost be less than two dollar. If you achieve, you are in the business. You are in the business. Okay, that is what, it is. and that is going to happen by twenty thirty. So hydrogen economy is going to be a reality. So, so I'm happy that this is what is happening. So when you have hydrogen, you may have big transport or you make synthetic fuels, but carbon dioxide we can convert to methane, you can convert to ethane and many other things. So that can go to obviously uh, petrol and diesel, or you can do upgrade the oil, you know, oil or the biomass hydrogenation. You have green ammonia, which is energy source, and so fertilizer industry will be benefiting. Then metal production, including steel and nickel. And part of that also goes to chemical and industrial processes. And we already know how to handle hydrogen in the chemical industry. And then heat and distributed power in the, in the cold country. So you see, whatever is the source of hydrogen, then the hydrogen can be used to generate power, and that can go into the grid. What it is that is the benefits of the hydrogen economy. And what is going to happen, according to McKinsey, is that by 2050, power generation, transport, all those things, there will be a tenfold increase. Okay. And that will be something like 539 million metric tons of hydrogen. So imagine whatever we are doing currently, all that will be achieved being hydrogen will be a very big, you know, really worth it. So in the net zero goal, hydrogen will be a source of energy and chemical. See, remember, solar energy or wind energy is not going to give us chemicals directly because there is no carbon. It is yes, carbon neutral, but hydrogen will be a reactant to give us this. So yes, the CO2 refinery of the future, you take CO2, the nature is doing to photosynthesis, we will do through hydrogen. Emission. So that is what methanol, dimethyl and formic acid will be very big bulk and bulk. So even otherwise, so my laboratory worked on this, that is we are taking solar energy, we have developed new molten salts which serve this solar energy, we have patents and then we take this copper chlorine cycle. So water is the only input, gets hydrogen and oxygen. As I mentioned to you earlier, what oxidation can do and hydrogenation of carbon dioxide, we have got a catalyst which doesn't decay even for 2000 hours. In fact, we are tested it for many times in this. And then they can make methane. And, and so you have mixture of methane and hydrogen, which can be sold, right? Right now, that is what we do. Synthetic natural. So we have hydrocarbons, methanol, dimethyl, carbonic acid, semias, alcohols, green, you know, fuel cell, hydrogen, like nickel. So we have contributed to this area. And so that is why I say that. And right now we are going to go up, and the students will be shifting there. And we are going to have the hydrogen production, then we'll have carbon dioxide methane and carbon dioxide methanol. I already sold one technology, dimethyl to go to the very refined days, and then to go to sell it as ICT go the way technology. Yes, yeah, so this is our ICT cycle. I will go into detail. But what I'm trying to tell you, 
because we are talking about this material and energy balance across all spectrum, spectrum, can we make zero waste society in next 10 years? That should be our target. That means nothing is wasted. Right? Whether it is a, you know, carbon dioxide, we take as a feedstock and not as a liability. So reduce, reuse, recycle, recover, landfill should be zero. Literally, the landfill area should shrink day by day. That will show our progress towards a zero waste society. So yes, and the so-called circular economy and food and feed and fuel debate, all those things, you know, fall in the proper place, right? So hydrogen will have a very big role in circular economy. That is what I'm trying to do. Yes, hydrogen. And so circular economy, I won't go into the details of this crowded science, the so-called green economy, bio economy, circular economy. These are the buzzwords used by many, many people. You know, many of these reports are available. And so, and so ultimately we see that the hydrogen economy in 2015, you will have regional trains, heavy duty trucks, medium trucks, vans, coaches, urban buses, small ferry, etc. New hydrogen applications will come out. There are existing applications. There will be network of hydrogen distribution. Then you have certain new simple cycle turbines and whatnot and steel, ammonia, methane, ammonia, everything will be there. So for hydrogen economy to be a reality, uh, so by 2050, 25, 24 to 25 percent of that will come from hydrogen. So hydrogen is going to be the savior of the world. So, and he, because people are talking about safety, somebody wrote an article, I will not mention it, I will another article saying that you know, by nature all fuels have some degree of danger, but anything depends on the source, the ignition source, oxidant and fuel, right? So even petrol is highly dangerous. So hydrogen properties are such that it makes safer, non-toxic than petrol and diesel because it is, a, it is rapidly dispersing it. As I told you earlier, it is 14 times lighter. So, testing of hydrogen system, tank leak test, garage leak simulation, and hydrogen tank drop test show that hydrogen can be produced, stored, and dispensed safely. So, there is no problem with hydrogen safety. I have to tell you, I have written an article just on 20 February in the Marathi newspaper because I was asked about this hydrogen safety and I wrote that question. Anyway, so green hydrogen is safer than conventional fuels. That is the take news. So no fuel is 100% safer, but green hydrogen has shown to be safer than conventional fuels in multiple aspects, in simulated states and what. So yes, hydrogen is safer. And uh, since uh, I have to be a little philosophical and I'm a sports fan in Vietnam here, each work has to pass through three stages. Radical opposition and then acceptance. Those who are ridiculing hydrogen economy are opposing, they will accept it before 2020. That is my hope. So, ladies and gentlemen, green hydrogen will be the savior of the world. Carbon dioxide should be taken as a feedstock and not liability. And hydrogen economy can be elegantly intertwined to make many chemicals from seagull sources and many other carbon sources. And government of India should adopt hydrogen economy to meet the demands of the Paris Agreement of 2015. And my technology is one of the technologies. I should not say as a scientist, it is the only that will be foolish. It is one of the technologies because we have proved that we can make hydrogen less than a dollar. Okay, so what is the message? Yes, we can do it. And finally, I must uh, thank a lot of my students. You know, I must correct the statistics. I have produced 107 PhDs. 115 patents are were granted patents, masters 134, post of 47 and now 298 patents today. And yes, and I was elected to the National Academy of Engineering of United States. That was a pinnacle and that is the credit to my institute where I went as a student and retired as a vision and I continue to work as emeritus professor. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for paying attention to my lecture. And if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yadav. I think it's really amazing to see the depth of your knowledge in range of field. Like this is a very complex field, it involves so many different techniques and research subjects. And I think you cover it extremely well, extremely well. And you also provided possible solutions that we should work on. Thank you very much for your time. And, and it's, it's, it's one of the very exciting webinar we had in recent times. So uh, now I request everyone to ask the question. There are some questions in the QA box, but before that, if there is a question, there are questions from a panelist, we can take them first. I also see Professor Anil Kakurkar is here. Welcome, Professor Anil Kakurkar. Thank you for coming. And I think uh, Dr. Sophia is also here. Yes. Hello, Professor. Hello, Professor. Hello, Professor. Hello, Professor. Hello, Thank you, thank you. I, I saw only last bit, I missed the earlier part, but it was interesting. Thank you, thank you for coming. Okay, so before I take the question from uh, the, uh, the QA box, uh, I have one question. Like you showed that with time, the, uh, the use of fossil fuels will be reduced, right? Up to 2050, it will like uh, 20%. But those are in a percent, numbers are in percentage. But amount of energy that we're going to require every year is also going to increase like a huge. So the the absolute value value of the fossil fuel use may be very high even after reduction in the percentage of use, the ratio of new, uh, renewable versus uh, the fossil fuel. Yeah, yeah, you know, I gave you a number there. I said the renewable contribution will go to seventy three percent, and that time the energy requirement will be forty nine thousand terawatt hours. So yeah. that number speaks for it. Okay, that yes. number speaks for it. In percentage wise, sometimes we can fool ourselves, but no, there it is actually the fact that more than 50% of that will be coming from renewable. You know, see nuclear energy or you know geothermal energy or hydro. Okay, hydrogen is a part of all this. So 73% that is the number which is predicted. That number may change here and there, but personally, as a scientist, I believe whenever there are technological problems, scientists have delivered better than expectations by the society. So 2050 is just a milestone which everybody is And my personal belief that we will achieve it much before that. Because technology advances like anything, you know. Nobody, nobody will believe that, you know, that today's technology and yesterday's technology, one problem we face, one technology always solves the problem of another technology which was created by technology, you know, over and of that technology. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks Professor Yadav. So I will take some questions from the, the QA box. And maybe if they are here, I will, uh, so uh, Joey Mitra asks one question. So let me see if I can activate uh, his audio video and then he can directly ask the question. So. Do you, uh, are you there? I have, yes, let's see here. Yes, so you can unmute uh, and ask the question. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yadav. It was a very enlightening talk. So I uh, wanted to know that uh, you have uh, mentioned that from lignin, we can uh, prepare different types of chemicals. So my question is, uh, it will always be a mixture. So how uh, do we prepare a single chemical? And uh, another thing is uh, that uh, depending on the source, the ratio of the phenolics that is there in the lignin that will always change. So, how to uh, maintain a uniformity? Very good question. You know what? Uh, this hydrogenation and oxidation reaction, when you take any biomass, they are sequential reactions. Okay. So, you can stop where you want to stop. What is required is a separation technology. What you are interested in. I can, I can start with bio oil and go to benzene, toluene, xylene also, believe me. There are catalysts. 
many, many times, you know, you can take a model component and go and show that. In fact, two of my students right now are working on that project in ICT. So, yes, hydrogenation and oxidation, these are sequential reactions, and you can stop. Believe me, having 100% conversion is a bad idea in chemical reaction because you don't get 100% if you are using equilibrium. You have to stop somewhere, use one of the things as in excess, and recycle the unreacted chemical, the starting material. That is a strategy. Because you are producing large number of chemicals, and all of them could be useful, particularly if you are doing, say, for example, HMF or even lignin or all those C5, C6 sugars, you require a proper separation technology. 80% industrial experience, 80% of the cost is associated with separation and not with the reaction, with separation. So downstream separation processes are very important. If you are doing with biotechnology, for example, it is all downstream process. Why chemical engineers are working in that area? Because it is all downstream process in here. Once you have the bug or enzyme, all other things are downstream. So here also, Downstream processing will play a very important role. Another important thing which you should know that distillation should not be used unless it is advisable because it's still distillation is a cost, you know, it, it, it is an expensive technology, maybe membrane technology because membrane technology is much cheaper than distillation. But the membrane, whether it is a polymeric membrane or it is a, you know, other kind of membrane, ceramic membrane or metal membrane, you have to use that because you want to separate that particular molecule where the, the cost is very, very cheap. So across the world, and if you have extraction, for example, extraction always has to be followed by distillation. So that because you use some solvent, you have to recover it and there are losses. So this problem boils down to separation technology. And what separation technology you want to use depending on which product you want. So you have to play with the reaction rates, you have to play with the temperatures, and you have to play with the reactor. And continuous processes will always be better than batch processes. Remember, even otherwise from safety viewpoint. Thank, okay. you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Uh, Sachin, you can ask your question. Sachin, unmute yourself and then ask the question. Hello, Dr. Yadav. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, 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 in short, actually, I because you know I'm um, I, uh, uh, as a new entrepreneur in India, so we are uh, for almost one year trying to get investors into this kind of uh, technologies. Those who will I mean, support this kind of technology development or commercialization, but still, in investors' minds, they are not confident. They are not coming to support us. So how means in 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 which manner we, we, we will present our means R and D or or uh, the commercialization? Are you a faculty member or industrialist? I am industrialist, sir. Okay, all right. See, industrialists want technology to be you know demonstrated on the pilot stage. So you know, my experience with pharma industry and all, they want to show know whether you can make it on you know five hundred gram or one kg and what will be the cost of production, then only they are ready to invest. Sir, uh, sir excuse yeah. me, sir, I'm sorry. Sir, we already proved uh, a means uh, lab scale concept in United States. Then we are trying to implement this technology in India, but still we are struggling. No means- uh, yeah, You know, listen, they, you see, anybody, these so-called investors, you know, they are interested in knowing whether they can make money at a faster rate. Okay. Yeah. So how convincing you are in demonstrating the technology, that is that is what depends, you know. It will depend on you. It mm -hmm. is not that sometimes, you know, because suppose you are associated with some web, big name or big IIT or some other well-known institute, mm -hmm. but they may trust you because already there is a record created. There is a, mm -hmm. You understand? So I understand, sir. You, you, if you have developed that technology, you have to demonstrate that to to the industry, you have to call them and the others because they are, you, you need money, right? You need money. So obviously nobody is going to invest in, you know, like, you know, in something where they don't make money. And, yeah. you know, sir, one, one more point, sir. Sir, I know, sir, 
Sachin, okay, can I take sir. some other questions and then I will come back sure, to you? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, 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 sir. okay, sir. okay sir. thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Rustam, you can ask the question. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Yadav, for a wonderful talk. Uh, you rightly conveyed that the problem of uh, reduction of global house gas emissions, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is really huge, but then the opportunity is also just as challenging and as huge. Now, considering that what you said of 35 gigatons of carbon dioxide being released in the atmosphere, can you please identify for us the first one, two or three process technologies that can make a dent in terms of reducing our global warming temperature rise. Yeah, so as I already told you, you have to reduce the consumption of crude, okay, where it is carbon dioxide being emitted. Okay, that is number one. And you have to have technologies, for example, suppose you are using a power plant and the carbon dioxide is going out, you have to have collect this carbon dioxide, it will have water vapor, it may have carbon, dioxide, carbon monoxide also, it may have some other impurities. You have to develop a catalytic process where that can be converted into maybe methanol or maybe dimethyl ether or carbonic acid or many other things, okay? including methane, for example, that can be done provided you use that mixture which is coming out of the power plant. In fact, right now we are doing experiments in ICT where we have shown that that carbon dioxide can be used to make methane and ethane. We have, we have done that. So the, 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 the use has to be very high value on the you know, chemicals and materials where you can uh, capture carbon dioxide. In some other cases, carbon dioxide which is stored underneath, that will be a feedstock when you have well developed technology. Okay, that is that is very important because that has to be a feedstock. If you do not have, you know, and, and this has to be a distributed thing, isn't it? This has to be a distributed thing. Or in the steel industry, because you were associated with that cement and steel, obviously that steel industry is a highly polluting industry. Okay, right now. And so there is an ACS report on that. So yes, if we can reduce, uh, bring that uh, oxides into the metal form by using hydrogen, that will be the best thing. So there, and you know, sometimes people talk about making uh, salicylic acid and all. No, that is not a solution. That is peanut. It is a drop in the ocean. What salicylic acid? You know, how much salicylic acid you will make and give direct to people? You know, that is that is not. So it has to be a bulk. Bulk chemical where technologically it is superior and can be practiced. Believe me, since we, we develop something together with ACC, you know that technology is not developed overnight. It requires a lot of efforts, a lot of you know, you know, investment, and sometimes this investment being close or rupees. But yes, and government has to help. Government can help in terms of the policy and also giving the seed funding. Okay, once you prove it, then yes, now that everybody, in fact, day before yesterday, the Niti the CEO, Dr. Uh, Amitabh Khan said, we can produce uh, hydrogen less than a dollar. These on, you know, on the record. Mukesh Ambani also said he can produce hydrogen less than a dollar. So it is good. That means the industry is very much interested in this and they want to reduce the global warming and bringing down the temperature to less than 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. But it is not going to happen overnight. We have to go towards that goal, for example. You know, so yes, sometimes you can have this, uh, uh, you know, fuel cell based uh, electric cars, two wheeler, three wheeler, four wheeler. Remember, 33% of the energy is consumed by housing industry. Okay, whenever we talk about this, 33% is consumed by housing industry. People only talk about cars and transport, but housing industry consumes a lot of energy. Okay, thank you, Professor Yadav. Thank so, Kandu, you. Uh, you have a question? Hi, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yadav. It's a really uh, very nice talk. Uh, I have a small uh, question regarding the very small part of your talk on the uh, recycling of the polythene. Yeah. So you told that it is the best way to recycle the polythene. 
but i uh, what i understood the the collection cost is going to be so high the people are not really interested to collect this uh, plastic and uh, rather they prefer to throw it so is it not possible to make some sort of plastic which is going to degrade by itself maybe after two or three years is going to degrade and is not going to give us a burden on our soil you know the, you know very good question you know what it means you want to be irresponsible throw it in the garbage and let somebody else take care of the problem what i am saying is that the collection should be done at the source if you are using that plastic bag at home whether it is a polythene bag or something the source the plastic bag you know what it is right or whether it is a vegetable vendor or you the milk pouch or whatever you know that it is polythene you will clean it give to the boy who comes and it so that the 80% of the cost which is spent on sorting out and all that thing that is all saved because it is not free you are getting your money back so you become responsible yes biodegradable polymers means what you dump anything in the nature and nature should take care of it and you enjoy no that way will never achieve that goal we have to be responsible even if it is biodegradable collection has to be very important and why 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 i said this solution for plastic pollution because if we handle that problem from so for upcycling downcycling or whatever or chemical recycling of plastics which is a well known technology there is nothing new in that you may develop some new cartridges but it is all known refineries are doing it we know how to handle hcl we know how to handle ammonia we know how to handle hcls okay all that thing is known that is what i am saying even this polyexo alcohol elements what it means when you talk about biodegradation the microbe insert oxygen into the mite and then the biodegradation starts so if you have a double bond and that oxygen goes then it will make epoxy and it will break that is what the mechanism is so already in the oxygenated polymers whether it is natural or you know synthetic that oxygen is the place where the degradation starts and ultimately it should go into some benign product maybe carbon dioxide in water and whatever right so that is what you aim when you say that biodegradable polymer okay i am saying why think of that why not be responsible and collect at our home only right now you are not throwing your newspaper are you throwing you are getting rathi you ask your wife she is getting money every month <laughs> whatever you get so same thing is if i am replacing and put some deposit on the bottle pet bottle or whatever i will 100% return it to get my money back in fact i may steal my neighbor's bottle also because i want to get more money isn't it so nothing free is appreciated in this world you remember even if you go to marriages you all sorts of food you know thai food malay food and italian food and then you want to taste it and throw it because it is free but if there was some money charge you would have paid you would have thought 100 times you should i buy it or should i not buy it? same thing is nothing free is appreciated plastic free is a bad idea make them pay some deposit it will encourage the digital economy even if you buy say delhi you buy some plastic and you return it in maharashtra you should get back the money whatever deposit you have given and that is what government should encourage yeah accordingly the policy of the government should be like that so that like we can take this uh, plastic and uh, return it to somewhere and which is uh, profitable for the yeah. people at least yeah, yeah that is what should be done in fact i have suggested to maharashtra government but that babu did not listen to me he said we have decided already so what can i do that is his problem okay thank you very much thank you thank you i think it's very exciting idea so uh, professor siva bom you can unmute and yeah. <coughs> Yeah, Professor Gada, it's a very excellent talk, and really enjoyed the the scale of uh, feature how we how we decarbonize, how we can better feature world. My because I come with the many years of industry background, and uh, just to a particular question is already in uh, Aditya Metal, for example, demonstrated in Hamburg already steel production using hydrogen. and sweden has already implemented how can we help in india taking a lead and and producing steel uh, using hydrogen because steel and concrete will be a commodity product which we need it always 
the major CO2 contribution. So uh, from my point of view, like uh, studies like in Royal Society has proven that uh, electrification, solar energy, wind energy, renewable energy can be used producing hydrogen. So how do we generate that climate in the steel industry in India? It's a very good question. You know, steel industry must be enticed to use hydrogen-based technologies. Okay. So that means government policy must dictate. Ministry of Steel must tell them that now you are producing enough of carbon dioxide and polluting and we are wedded to this, you know, the Paris Accord, Paris Agreement. No, our policy is this. Now, like government say, like Honorable Nitin Karkari uh, said, by 2030, it will be e-vehicle policy. That e-vehicle includes this uh, hydrogen fuel cells driven cars also, right? So why not government say this, that you will be given incentive for using hydrogen. So the fellows who have developed some hydrogen technology, they will set up their plants, you know, near the steel plants and that hydrogen could be used. That is the only way to do it. So Ministry of Steel, Sand and Technology, maybe the Prime Minister's office, they must collaborate and decide that because it is in the interest of uh, India. The policy makers, maybe Nitya also, uh, just uh, come in and uh, say that yes, this is what is required. Gee, this is a part like ammonia and uh, green uh, hydrogen and green ammonia. It's a very good, uh, you know, welcome uh, decision by the government. That means government is really interested, and I'm sure they are definitely thinking on uh, green steel. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar. Sir. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Yadav. Again, it was very uh, informative talk from you. And thank you for the panel for allowing me to ask my question. Basically, I have two questions and uh, I am from National Metallurgical Laboratory. So with respect to this hydrogen economy, my first question is uh, that I think that uh, this uh, infrastructure of this hydrogen economy in our nation and developing nation like India, would be much more uh, tight target than the hydrogen technology itself. So I, I would like to have your opinion. And the other thing is that uh, to produce hydrogen and to utilize it for producing power or uh, transportation or other uh, uh, sectors where we are producing energy to do something, uh, can we use this uh, source, uh, solar source or other source to store energy in thermal or uh, as well as electrical? Because as per one of the recent talks from our earlier director in terms of LC of this hydrogen economy, uh, as per his talk, uh, storage was one of the better option than to produce hydrogen and utilize it in other uh, things. Thank you. Well, it's a, you know, I, a, a very good question. You know, uh, since you are from NML, I visited your lab and you have some collaboration with uh, Tata Steel, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, hydrogen has to be promoted and it is policy and government help. Remember, if you if I make something, I tell you something, it will be a political statement. Fertilizer industry is all subsidized, you know that. Why not subsidize hydrogen industry for some time till they come up to a certain level and believe me, because everybody across the world is interested in hydrogen economy and the hydrogen council is talking about it and the hydrogen council membership is increasing day by day. Why are they investing in all these things? Because they know and Germany has already started about this ammonia as a source of hydrogen. They are piping and all. Okay, so I think India will not be left far behind. Okay, the initial cost is there, you know, investment is always there. This is, a, this is a highly capital intensive industry. But the rewards will also be there. They will come sooner. The payback, the industrialist normally looks at the payback period. What is the payback period? Two years, three years, four years. See, plants like ammonia, they are standard capacity using carbon and they are cheap, isn't it? Ammonia is very cheap. But you look at the technology development, day by day, the ammonia 
you know, energy consumption per unit ton has gone down substantial. Actually, it has come to theoretical value. Okay. So this will happen in the case of hydrogen also. Once we improve the efficiency of production and the storage, hydrogen will be a very good uh, vehicle because it is called an energy carrier. Remember, you? hydrogen is an energy carrier. So definitely we will have that. So don't have any apprehensions. If you are working in that area, go ahead and work with the industry. Yes, sir. I, I raised this point because still we are at about 100 million tons of steel and our target is to go towards 300 million tons of steel. So yes. new yes. new setups may be uh, this uh, hydrogen based setup. So it will be, I guess, helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it, actually this year they say India will have 100 and because last year I think 106 ton, uh, million tons was produced. Yeah. It is and 120. It will be 120. So if yes. you want to go to 300, imagine the kind of carbon dioxide we are going to emit in the atmosphere. And we are signing uh, our great uh, Paris Agreement, isn't it? So India has a responsibility. Yes. India has a responsibility because it's a signatory and highly populous country. So we cannot sh uh, shy away from our responsibility. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Professor Yadav, we'll take one more question from a very young student, Siddharth. Siddharth, you can unmute and uh, ask the question. Hello, sir. Um, oh. So, uh, you mentioned about hydrogen uh, economy. So, my question was that hydrogen is a very light gas. So, uh, to store it, we need a very high pressure and uh, uh, means a very tight, secured uh, tank. So if we if we have uh, tanks like this everywhere, it will cost a lot, na, right? And the capacity it will not be as much as we need, like uh, to power all the all the cars and vehicles, probably. Yeah, so how will yeah. we deal with that? So I I'll tell you, I'll tell you this interesting thing because you asked me because you always yeah you know for liquefaction of hydrogen you require very high pressure and the tank size and the thickness will really increase right i i tell a simple solution already people are using this okay in uh, in korea and in california you know smaller the diameter of the storage vessel lesser is the thickness so instead of a big tank you know you have to use you know, tubes, multi-tubular shell and tube type of reactors or storage tanks. Okay, that is one. Another is the adsorption technology. People have been developing in the form of hydrides, you know, carbon nanotubes, multiple kind. That kind of research is moving on and it should go. So hydrogen storage will not be a problem in future. Right now, uh, you think that it is a gas which can explode. When I have already mentioned it, but I have a slide there to show that hydrogen is not as dangerous as petrol. Believe me, hydrogen is not as dangerous. It is 14 times lighter, so I told you. And at the same time, uh, you know, uh, it is a non toxic gas. Okay, it is non toxic gas. So you, you don't worry, the technology will be developed, storage technology will be developed and transport it. So what happens in the case of hydrogen, you know, refilling tanks, you know, so long distance or short distance, you know, short distance electric vehicles will be very easy because the two energy for you, you know, but the, the electricity generated by using hydrogen fuel cells, something like that. And long distance trucks and big vans and whatnot, that is what is being predicted that both these things will exist, coexist. Okay, both these things will pull as far as technology is concerned. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yadav, for taking all these questions and very insightful answers. I guess we all are uh, motivated by your talk and uh, hopefully we will also contribute in this dream of uh, net zero for India. Thank you very much for your time. I think we all enjoy your talk like anything and, and thank you very much for, for, for giving this uh, nice webinar. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank Great. You. Nice seeing so many Star Wars, uh, for this particular time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Yadav. Thank you, everyone, for attending the talk. We end here where we're going to upload this uh, nice talk on YouTube uh, soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Professor Yadav.